This all came to an end in the decade after 2005. It didn't. Look at the reforms that, that uh, President Nazarbayev introduced. A whole series of them touched on regional matters. We, we, far more, if you read the fine print, far more than was acknowledged at the time. He, he said, uh, if I can find it, I, uh, he actually made an astonishing statement uh, in, in which he, uh, in um, 2005, he said, we share economic interests, we share cultural heritage, uh, we, we uh, uh, are face common external threats. We should, do our, we should direct our efforts toward closer economic integration and a, a common market and a single currency. This is Nazarbayev in 2005. So this, this ideal never died. And under the last decade of President Karimov's rule, the now president of Uzbekistan, then prime minister, Mirziyoyev, was busy doing exactly the same thing. They were, they were both planning re reforms. Not the, the Kazakhs were way ahead in implementation, especially in the economic sphere. But all this was being planned in the period uh, after 2005. We, uh, I think one of our failures, I, we, uh, was adequately to appreciate the importance of what was going on under the surface of life in both countries. So, and these are the two countries that really are drivers to the region. So this brings us to 17, uh, to 16 and 17, when you have the death of Karimov and the rise of Mirziyoyev. Uh, he obviously, he'd been the guy who kicked the tires across the country. He knew, he, he was his prime minister. He visited every little bureaucrat everywhere, however obscure, knew his name, knew his wife's name, you know, knew, knew every, all the mischief that he'd been up to. Uh, this is the kind of, kind of fellow he was. And, and so he's suddenly president and, and immediately goes off on this vast reform movement, which, which begins, interestingly, on regionalism by delineating borders, opening borders, op expanding trade, all that stuff. This was his first move, not his second or third move. So it was in it, and, and, and you have, therefore, some amazing things taking place. Uh, in May of this year, you had the five leaders in Astana, uh, um, invited there by Nazarbayev, in the name of, of the president of Uzbekistan, which is remarkable in itself. Again, these are the two driver countries. Inviting the uh, presidents to come there, they all, sh they all come or send a representative in one case, and launch a process of regional meetings. In June uh, of this year, they, they, they bring a resolution to the Un United Nations as a region in which they call on the world to recognize us as a region. There, this reality is way ahead of what we're talking, how we talk about this stuff in Washington. And then in February, in Tashkent, there's going to be a big conference on exactly this question of how do you organize things regionally. So, so it's not just a abstract concept that we'll, we'll, we'll think regionally, you know. No, no, they want to translate it into institutions. So this is all, all uh, taking place. My point is this. This is a train that's left the station. Everyone is behind it. They, yes, the, the Turkmen are cautious as usual and a little, uh, you know, they, but they, they, they do have a complicated deal, making sure that this is thoroughly non-aligned and all that. But they've come along. They haven't, they haven't bolted on anything, and on the contrary, they are among the big, most enthusiastic um, in terms of uh, assistance that Central Asia could pro provide to, to Afghanistan. And look at their new railroad to, to uh, Tajikistan and all this. Stuff. So my point is they're all on board. This is a reality. 
Uh, it, if it happens, it will be the it will make it very much more difficult to uh, to to uh, to to divide and conquer that strategy, which has been a favorite of Moscow's all the way back to Gurktepe. Uh, that that is going to be much harder game to play in the future. Not impossible because this is not emerging. This is not a Slyanya Narodov. This is not a, as, as, as Gorbachev used to say, this is, this is something that preserves sovereignty, it preserves currencies, independent economies, and so on. But it involves coordination and cooperation of a level that we haven't seen. Now, the key question as of this minute is, OK, let's accept all this. How do you institutionalize it? This is the mother of all questions, because there are all sorts of different ways of doing it. And I turn it over to Svante Cornell, who is the world authority on this issue. If there is by a, default. By default, I was going to say. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, with that background, what we have uh, over the past um, year or two not only been following this process, but been interacting very closely with some of the prime movers, if you will, in Central Asian capitals, and they have shown increasing, um, increasing curiosity to other world models, because obviously they they have realized that they don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, yes, there is a past practice and experience of Central Asian cooperation from the 1990s to 2005, as Fred mentioned, and then somewhat under the carpet after that. But we've seen, and I won't go through the whole political science jargon of the waves of regionalism in the world, uh, but the point is that there are other uh, world regions that have had more or less similar conditions and have embarked on more or less successful attempts to build, to build real regional cooperation. Now, I want to be clear that we're not talking about supranational structures like the European Union, continent-wide supranational structures like the European Union. This is not what Central Asians are trying to do. They're not uh, embarking on a project to lose their sovereignty into some bigger structure. Uh, and that, therefore, also, we're not talking about or looking at the Eurasian Economic Union as a model, uh, even though two of the Central Asian states are members, because this, again, is really a supranational project, which also I've spent most of our uh, re recent decades working on. Uh, but the questions that we've been trying to answer are very specific for Central Asia, which is how did these various organizations or regions solve particular issues like the movement of people and labor, handling uh, the facilitation of trade and transport, how to institutionalize cooperation and how deeply to do that, um, how do you handle outside powers, very important for Central Asians to say the least, and how do you handle the fact that some of your members have different memberships in continent-wide organizations? Um, so looking at that, I think we'll, um, uh, I'll, I'll just take them from the perhaps less relevant to the more relevant models. But I think all of them, even the ones uh, because of their failures or limitations, also have lessons for Central Asia. So uh, the Visegrad model, of course, which brings together four Central European countries, is one that even President Nazarbayev mentioned uh, at the 2018 Astana Summit of Central Asian Leaders as, uh, um, as a informal, a model of informal uh, consultations of, of leaders of Central Asia. Uh, but I think already now we can say that uh, the uh, Central Asian cooperation is moving really beyond what the Visegrad groups uh, enables or permits, uh, which is a form of informal and close coordination with yearly meetings ahead of states and also regular meetings at lower levels of, uh, of government. Well, there is a reason why the four Central European countries have not uh, developed their, their cooperative structures more than they have, and that is because they are part of both NATO and the European Union, which means that it's kind of redundant for them to develop cooperation in fields that are already covered by their NATO membership or by their EU membership. Now, that is a choice that they have made, and I think they have been correct in, in, in making the, the, uh, the uh, determining that membership in the EU and NATO are beneficial enough that it overrides or overrules the need for, or the, 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 uh, the alternative, which would have been to have a much more developed cooperation among the four states. Uh, but if you look at Central Asian states, uh, there is no pan-regional co or continent-wide cooperation format that, that is available to them that would enable them to, so to speak, have a, a, um, 
uh, what I think some people to the north in, in Russia would prefer, which is to focus energies on Eurasian cooperation, not Central Asian cooperation. And then Central Asians can have meetings if you like, but they should all be members of this pan-Eurasian uh, uh, organization structures, whether that be uh, Eurasian Union, whether it be the Eurosec, whether it be CSTO, or for that matter, even if you include China, the, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The way we look at it, the, um, the, and I think the way Central Asians look at it, there are benefits to Eurasian cooperation, but it doesn't, it is uh, the differentials in size and power and economics um, between the behemoth countries of Eurasia and the Central Asian countries are such that they will inevitably, simply by the forces of nature, be squelched uh, and be relegated to a secondary status in any form of regional cooperation that is based on, on continent-wide structures. Uh, in other words, uh, Central Asian cooperation has to remain Central Asian in order to avoid losing its purpose. And um, in that sense, you could already see that even the, the Central Asians have basically re reached the Visegrad level of cooperation. For example, uh, Central Asian states are right now looking to create a Schengen-type visa that would allow foreigners to visit all countries in Central Asia on a single visa. Well, that's something that is, in the case of Europe, a Schengen issue and therefore an EU prerogative. Um, now, if we look at uh, Mercosur, Mercosur is also not one of the more most uh, the most relevant cases. But I think there are some some issues in Mercosur that actually have relevance for Central Asia. Uh, I think the point is that Mercosur was a which, of course, is built really around the Brazil Argentina relationship with Paraguay and others, and then having been coming and going, as I'll mention in a moment. Uh, and what it, it was initially a success story in the 1990s, particularly because it achieved a tenfold increase in trade among its members. Uh, member states had not really been, in trade terms, been focused on trade with each other, but trade with other parts of the world. Uh, and I think that is a very relevant for Central Asia because we have seen over the past 25 years very much a unfulfilled potential of trade within Central Asian countries. Instead, they have been very much focused on est establishing their trade links with other parts of the world. Um, the problem is that the, uh, there are two, a couple of things that make Mercosur problematic. And one of them is the lack of, it really boils down to, to the lack of institutionalization or the weakness of the institutions of Mercosur, which led to uh, problems uh, when Brazil devaluated its currency in 99, and of course two years later Argentina's economy collapsed. And then you had politics taking over with left-wing politicians trying to transform Mercosur into a bloc that would be somehow in opposition to American-led imperialist projects in, in South America. Um, and then um, Argentina and Brazil started developing a practice of negotiating exceptions to the agreed norms and rules of Mercosur for themselves. And obviously because of their dominance and because of the weakness of the rules-based structure of Mercosur, they were able to do that. Uh, and then uh, political shifts, quite strong shifts in those countries led to very deep problems, very much involving the very membership of the organization. So uh, the Workers' Party government in Brazil was very interested in getting Venezuela <coughs> into Mercosur in the early two 2010s. Uh, now Paraguay didn't agree with that. Uh, and since uh, Paraguay's opposition was really the only factor preventing <coughs> Venezuela from getting in, they suspended Paraguay from membership over some technicality over a presidential election, admitting Venezuela into the organization because they take decisions by consensus. And then a shift to center-right government in Brazil in 2015 uh, and a conservative government in Argentina for the first time in a long time in 2016 led Venezuela to be suspended. So you have even the very membership of the organization being you know, shifted uh, on the basis of these very uh, short-term political, political um, uh, criteria. So I think what we can learn from Central Asia, for, for Central Asia for Mercosur is that you know, we have clearly in Central Asia a situation where we have top-down government structures. Cooperation is based on the presidents basically agreeing with each other today. If they don't institutionalize that into something more robust, there is very much a risk of similar, uh, a similar development of Mercosur happening down the road, which is that the quality of cooperation will be dependent on short-term political calculations and personal relationship between the leaders. Only by developing serious institutions that go down into the bureaucracies and preferably outside of state bureaucracies into civil society and other, would you be able to, to get uh, uh, 
a form of cooperation that outlives, if you will, the uh, the interests of the of the of the top leaders. Uh, let me see where I am here, and that brings us to uh, another region uh, uh, in the increasing relevance, if you will, uh, and which is the Nordic region, which may seem miles away, and it is miles away from Central Asia, and, and of course a very different situation, uh, both geopolitically and economically. However, the, the Nordic region has a lot of similarities to Central Asia that you may or may not have thought about. Uh, the first is uh, in terms of the close cultural and historical relationship among the countries, and the second is uh, if you look at how they have related to pan-continental regional structures, it actually has similarities to Central Asia. Uh, in, in many ways, much more than to Southeast Asia. Um, so the Nordic countries, of course, have uh, share, with the exception of Finland, a common linguistic origin, the Scandinavian languages, just like Central Asians, except Tajikistan, are, are, are Turkic-speaking. And also, uh, no country has a dominant position. They're roughly equal in size. Yes, Sweden has 10 million people, and uh, well, Iceland is an outlier, obviously, but in, in Denmark, Norway, and, and Finland have about half of that population. Um, but in spite of all these very close cultural uh, and, and linguistic similarities, they have completely different approaches to uh, issues like NATO and EU membership. Now, I'm just People already know this, obviously, but Denmark is the only country in that region to be a member both of the EU and NATO. Norway and Iceland are members of NATO, not the EU. Sweden and Finland are members of the EU and not NATO. Uh, that's actually not totally, but to, to a certain extent quite similar to have how Central Asians have related to being members or not being members in various larger organizations, including, of course, the neutrality issue which Turkmenistan has, which in Scandinavia is slowly dissipating into the post-Cold <laughs> World War. Uh, but what the point is, and we go at some greater length in the paper about this, is that the Nordic model shows that even where you have such divergent policies towards membership in larger and very important organizations like NATO and the EU, that's not a hindrance to be able to build very meaningful regional cooperation in issues that matter both to the governments and to their citizens. Um, and not only uh, is it possible to have such cooperation, but you can build cooperation that complements and in many ways has been a forerunner for continent-wide cooperation. So the, the Nordic Passport Union from the 1950s is very much what Schengen, the, the whole idea of Schengen is based, if you will, explicitly or rather non-explicitly, implicitly on the Nordic Passport Union and how that was developed from the 1950s onwards. Uh, but I also want to make another point about this, which is that even though these countries are don't share a common posture on security and military matters, they have been able in the past 10 years, especially in the past five years, to build very serious elements of Nordic defense cooperation. It shows that in spite of deferring membership uh, in security structures, whether, let's say whether you're a member of the CSTO or not, it is possible to, uh, to build regional cooperation in the realm of hard security issues if that is something you would like to do. Now, um, ASEAN is, of course, uh, one that Central Asians talk a lot about. Uh, it's probably the most developed of all the, the studies. I mean, this is uh, of the regions we have looked at, and it's an organization that is trying to basically reach the EU level of, uh, of integration. Whether that's something you want to do or not is another question. Um, but uh, our friend Bilahari Kasikan from Singapore observed uh, not long ago that uh, ASEAN states, states have much less in common uh, even after 50 years of cooperation than Central Asian states have today. Uh, they, of course, d diverge fundamentally in terms of what language they speak, their ethnicity, their religious traditions, and their levels of economic development. So uh, the ASEAN countries are much more diverse in every imaginable criteria than the Central Asian states are. Uh, they also were able, to, however, they were able to develop their uh, regional cooperation in a very intense geopolitical context, both during the Cold War as well, of course, as with the rise of China now in Asia more recently, and have been able to do so in spite of that very intense geopolitical environment, which of course is an important lesson for Central Asia. And uh, one particular distinctive feature of ASEAN has been how the organization has been able uh, to build a, first build a level of internal solidarity, which is that to show to foreign powers, whether it be in the Cold War or, or subsequently, that their primary uh, affiliation or affinity is with each other, 
and secondly, and building upon that, that they are that they are dealing with these foreign powers not one by one, but as a group. And obviously, we've seen this, and we see this on a daily basis in Central Asia, how the large powers like to deal with countries one by one. They don't like to deal with countries as a group. They prefer to pick them out, pick out, and have bilateral relationships that are to the benefit of the greater power. Whereas, of course, for the smaller countries, if they are able to band together and speak as a unit, that'll be beneficial for them. And ASEAN, I think, offers a very, uh, a very good model for how that can be done. Um, and we see not only that they're able to build relationships like ASEAN plus China or ASEAN plus, um, they have, I think, over a dozen dialogues with countries as, as di divergent as I mean, Russia, Germany, Turkey, I think, uh, and Central Asians could similarly build ways and have informally already started doing this. I mean, they've already started building a format such as the C5 plus one with the United States or with, and Japan were the first to do this and, and the EU has done that as well. But I think over uh, in the future, a very key question for the Central Asians is if they will be willing to and able to and see benefits in doing the same thing with the greater powers of Eurasia. How can you, so to speak, deal with them together rather than having to deal them uh, one by one? Um, now, um, in closing, I guess I think the, the um, the comparative examination of these structures uh, really boils down to the conclusion that seems almost obvious that institutions matter, uh, that the weakness and ineffectiveness of Mercosur and to some extent Visegrad is because of their weak institutional structures, and that the longevity and the ability of ASEAN and Nordic Council to, uh, and Nordic cooperation to remain relevant has been because of the seriousness that the founders put into building sustainable institutions. And that is, so to speak, brings us back to where we are in Central Asia today because we really don't have any. We have a willingness to have regional cooperation. We have a moment with good relations among all the countries and their, and their leaders. We have informal dialogues and the question then is how, at which pace, and with what end goal do you, do you so to speak, um, uh, turn this regional cooperation or this interest in regional cooperation into formalized structures. And the way we look at it, I think the, uh, the, the, the tendency very frequently um, could be to, um, uh, there is an urge to agree on the most um, visible matters, if you will. But I think what you've seen from other areas of the world is that sometimes you have to start with areas that are not the most uh, high, the high level of high politics, if you will. But the important part is, I think, to ensure that Central Asian cooperation is not only meetings of ministers or presidents or foreign ministers, but that you have, that you institutionalize this cooperation so that bureaucrats, whether it be in the, the transportation sector, in the health sector, or education, or whatever you like, uh, start knowing each other and start thinking regionally even as they act nationally. And of course, this brings us to the uh, a, a very important issue, which is who? The who, who is part of this cooperation? As as uh, as Fred mentioned, it is obvious that the main forces in Central Asia are the five Central Asian countries, and the leaders of this process will have to be Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, because that is, you know, without them and without that axis being the uh, the leading, nothing is really going to happen. The primary question is how Afghanistan will be uh, included in this. Uh, that is going to be necessary to some extent. Are they a full member? Are they a full member from the start or later? Uh, of whatever Central Asian cooperation is being developed. And the other, I would say, perhaps not equally visible, but equally important question is how the caucuses is linked to this. If you have regional cooperation institutionalized in Central Asia, you still need a way out of Central Asia. Afghanistan gets you part of it <laughs> to the ocean, but it doesn't get you all the way. Uh, and as, as was already mentioned, in the early days of Central Asian cooperation, there was a window open to Azerbaijan being included. Lately, we've seen Azerbaijan being looking increasingly east, but not only Azerbaijan. I think it's important that the Caucasus as a whole, which today practically means uh, Georgia primarily, Armenia at some later point when their problems with Azerbaijan have been resolved. Georgia is much, much like Azerbaijan, also looking east and trying to build its role in the world not only as the easternmost corner of Europe, which in many ways the Caucasus is, but also 
as, a, uh, uh, as an economic and geopolitical zone that links Europe to Central Asia. And that will only become more important as Central Asia becomes, uh, is modernizing, is developing, and is cooperating. So how Central Asian cooperation includes the Caucasus, links to the Caucasus, which obviously will be noticed by people in other capitals, if you, to put it mildly, is, is a matter which will... What do you do about it? <clears throat> Let me offer quick comments on how the three <clears throat> major external powers that are interested in this region might respond. Uh, let me begin with, with by noting that all three of them voted positively on the UN resolution that I uh, referred to earlier, uh, which, in which the Central Asians, which recognizes the Central Asians as a region with their own interests and specifics. Uh, all voted for it. <coughs> along with 43 other countries. Um, and, and it's also, uh, if we start with China, uh, is the most present of the foreign powers, it's, it's worth noting that the head, two of the recent heads of the SCO, including the incoming one, Mr. Nora from Uzbekistan, are Central Asians. Uh, and they're thoroughly attuned to these sensitivities that we've been talking about here. I can assure you, both of them, both the Tajik former foreign minister and now uh, very soon in January, uh, Mr. Noroff, these people are very ac acutely sensitive to the, the uh, uh, interests of Central Asia as a region and protecting them and, and so on. That, that's not irrelevant. In general, the Chinese have been very cautious in their statements on the subject of Central Asia regionalism. Uh, they've basically been saying, uh, well, that's their business. Uh, we don't see any reason to mess around with it. And, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that, that uh, position won't hold. Uh, their bigger interest is, of course, getting transportation across the area. The last thing they could need to do is to alienate them, and and uh, and and yes, investment too. But um, I, I, so far, the Chinese response has been surprisingly moderate. There are a number of articles that have been written, and and by by fairly prominent people. So I think these. Now, Russia, <coughs> you have a different, different picture entirely. <coughs> Mr. Lavrov, uh, who is not disinterested in, in uh, the affairs of the former Soviet Union, I have to remind you, if you're not aware of this, his, his father is Armenian, and his, and his mother is Russian, but from Georgia. Um, so he, he's a guy that grew up with a sort of imperial cast of mind, uh, but, but, and he, he's been, he's been uh, struggling to contain himself uh, on this subject. He, he has been very polite up to now, saying even when, for example, the U.S. recognized these five, that didn't, foolishly, uh, Mr. Kerry didn't include Afghanistan, even though the Central Asians wanted him to, in the C5 plus one. But Mr. Lavrov has, has said that uh, he thinks that's, uh, you know, it's okay with him if, 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 uh, if the Central Asians want to meet with the Americans. The immediate response from every capital in Central Asia is, uh, what's, what business of his, is it of his to approve or disapprove? We're sovereign states. Uh, so one has to be suspicious of that, but in the end of the day, uh, he, it isn't Lavrov. Lavrov has never been a, uh, the, the policy strategy maker. That comes from Putin, and and there you, I think you, unfortunately, have the model of Ukraine, where he's where they've been very clear, said what we really want is to is to neutralize and federalize. The country, in other words, divided up into as much as possible, uh, setting region against region, and to neutralize it inter internationally, uh, which the Ukrainian government has characterized as a policy of dismemberment. 
Uh, I assume that this will eventually come out in, 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 in public in, in terms of Af uh, Central Asia as well. Uh, they were, uh, I reported here a couple of months ago about the, about the uh, reception in Moscow of the proposal of the Central Asian countries to, to mediate between uh, Afghanistan uh, and, and the Taliban. And this, this proposal came from the six Central Asian countries, strongly, with strong backing from, from Ta Kabul. And when the Russians heard about it, Lavrov got on the phone and blew up and said, we're going to, we're going to have these meetings ourselves. We'll take care of it. You guys bug out. And uh, at which point, they, the presidents conferred. And they charged Ghani with picking up the phone and calling Lavrov, who, who apparently blew up at him. But uh, there was nothing he could do. Uh, they went ahead. Now, now we don't know where, where this is uh, going to lead. Uh, but I think we could be region, region, reasonably skeptical about how Russia will handle this. Um, if you take Russia's stated interests in the region, uh, which have to do with security, which have to do with, uh, with extremism, which have to do with drug control, which has to do with corruption. And all three of these are areas that, that, that the Central Asians will be able to do better on their own than with uh, outside tutelage. And, and if, if the Central Asians are able to make progress on any of these areas, or all of them, on their own, uh, it would be, uh, uh, be, be the Russians would be obliged to, to say, that, well, those weren't really our interests. We have other ones. And they'd have to show their cards. Uh, it's a very fragile situation. Uh, there are already signs that they're using some strategic investment uh, uh, to, to deal with this. And the old divide and conquer game is still underway. Now, how does the US respond to this? That's, that's really the big question. Up to now, we really haven't. Uh, we, we did do the C5 plus 1. Uh, but that has not been a, a, a expanded to include Afghanistan. Uh, this, this was a proposal that came, by the way, originally from Uzbeks. It was then developed and refined by the Kazakhs. They, uh, uh, Ambassador Umarov brought it to the State Department, and the State Department acted on it. But we have yet to really to take that with the seriousness that it deserves. Uh, it, we, we should elevate it, we should expand it, and we should, we, we should raise the level of U.S. involvement. Uh, that has yet to happen. I, I suspect it could well happen. Uh, I think it's also an interesting prospect that uh, we could begin a conversation, certainly with China, about mutual self-restraint. Uh, in the region. I think that's one that uh, is possible to have with the Chinese. I think the Chinese would, would accept uh, a deal on that in which we understand that we're not going to, uh, uh, each of us is going to practice a certain degree of self-restraint and the confidence that the other will do so as well. Uh, that, that is the kind of uh, progress that could be made immediately. But we have yet fully to take advantage of the Central Asians' own offer to take an active role in Afghanistan. We could be pushing this at very, very, very low cost. No matter what happens in Afghanistan, that's in our interest to promote that. Uh, we, we have yet to seize this. But so far, our reaction has been uh, um, been positive. Uh, certainly, that's their right. It's not unlike the Chinese, uh, but we we have yet to seize this opportunity. Let alone to see how valuable it is in with respect to <coughs> future of Afghanistan on the one side and. Uh, the Caucasus on the other, because the trade routes we're talking about all, <coughs> all go through this region. And whether you're talking about Afghanistan to Turkmenistan or Tajikistan to Tur uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, they all, they all go through this region. And these, these are the great east-west corridors. 
So we should we should be uh, 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 cognizant of that as we as we uh, as we develop a strategy, and also of the fact that exactly that kind of trade and the peripheral secondary trade that that contributes to is what is most likely to turn around some of these uh, weaker economies in the area. And you think that's not going to happen tomorrow morning? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Fred. Thank you, Swante. I think uh, uh, the, uh, we have a very interesting picture, of, of course, uh, uh, described here. And uh, uh, most of the uh, points that were made here describe really the uh, political uh, institutional infrastructure uh, that is in place and evolving and developing. There are also other elements like physical infrastructure is also developing that facilitates this type of regionalism. Central Asia being connected to Afghanistan, Central Asia being connected to China, Central Asia through Kazakhstan, and I think that's also part of the uh, picture that we are dealing today. So with that said, I would like to open now for, for questions and uh, maybe comments. Uh, Ambassador Kobashvili, Farouk, and then, uh, then Bill. Start here. Thank you. Can I sit or should I stand? Sorry? Should I stand or can I? It's up to you, but introduce yourself, please. OK, Temuri Yakubashvili. Um, a, I was surprised that you did not mention two other regional organizations uh, with a very different and questionable, in some cases, success stories. One is Guam, which would be obvious institution in a post-Soviet space and uh, Uzbekistan used to be a member of it. Uh, second is a more benign but very interesting institution called the Mediterranean uh, Parliamentary Assembly. Again, uniting countries that uh, have a geographic proximity to each other are members of different institutions, one of NATO and the EU, and other just the Islamic cooperation organization, whatever, uh, which kind of replicates the picture without sea um, in Central Asia. And the uh, bigger question for me is why? Why we should have the regional cooperation? If it happens, it's fantastic, but why we need to? Because uh, Geographically, is it a region? Yes. Is it politically a region? Probably. Or it can be. But uh, when uh, Dr. Starr was talking about Chinese interests, it's uh, rather interesting that all regional cooperation actually was boosted by the Chinese initiatives of One Belt, One Road. The road that they built, it fosters the regional cooperation. Infrastructure, for example. Infrastructure that was built by Russians also you know, somehow supported the regional cooperation. Are there any initiatives, local initiatives, that can foster the regional cooperation in infrastructure or in anything else? I mean, visa is great, but it's a globalized world. I mean, come on, they're lagging behind everybody else in the world. They're catching up. Uh, I'm not asking, so my question is, um, what do you think about these two institutions? I'm formulating that question. And uh, um, if you think that there is any merit in examining these two. And second, if there are any homegrown initiatives, not uh, to catch up with the rest of the world, but to be genuinely unique for Central Asia that can manifest as the greater willingness of the Central Asia to become a region politically. Yes. You want to start, Fred? Uh, just the last one. I'll let Svante deal with the first one. But the last one, the, 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 one of the great cons that's taken place in the last f 10 years is the Chinese have managed to persuade the world that every bit of infrastructure being built anywhere is theirs. Uh, whereas uh, the, the Kazakhs uh, built a lot of it, uh, are putting out a lot of money for infrastructure, not to mention their ports, three ports that are building, Turkmen port, 
uh, Turkmenbashi, the road and railroad completely across the country to Afghanistan and now into Afghanistan completely with their own money. The Azeris building Ailat, the, the, all the roads that go, that, 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 and railroads Real. that connect to it, uh, not to mention the, the, the three Georgian ports that have been reconstructed or are being built. These are all local or Western financed and, 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 not, and not Chinese, and yet they appear on Chinese maps as part of the... No, but the, all of them hope to have a Chinese group. They what? Chinese goods for transit. They want Chinese oh. goods. Well, uh, maybe. We'll see. That's up to the market. But there's no other market. That's the problem. Uh, Europe. Europe, from Europe to China. <laughs> yeah. But not only. Central Asia itself, Afghanistan, India, other countries. So that's a long conversation, of course, and long, uh, maybe, uh, shot in terms of uh, uh, the volumes that will be uh, flowing from uh, some of these uh, newer, relatively developing uh, economies like Afghanistan. But there's definitely uh, you know, volumes that are justifying current infrastructure and upcoming infrastructure. There will be uh, others coming, uh, coming uh, once we will be moving forward. If you look at the trade, as you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, volumes between um, uh, subcontinent, Indian subcontinent and, and Europe, which is currently only going through through sea, and uh, there is also, but I don't want to uh, take too much of your time. Uh, Stephanie, there is a, a question. Just, 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 yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Sorry. No, I think the, the, there are obviously many organizations that could have been mentioned. I mean, South African Development Community is another one. I mean, uh, I really like your parallels with the Nordic Council, and uh, basically. Besides these economic issues, social issues, I think that also these two regions diverge in terms of informality. So the level of informality in Central Asia is much higher than we can find in, uh, in uh, Nordic countries. Even like, you know, migration is somewhat similar, right? So we can find, for example, Swedish migrants working in Norway, like we can find, for example, Tajik migrants working in Kazakhstan. Uh, but the question of informality, so how much we should institutionalize that? Uh, because institutionalization for the sake of institutionalization wouldn't work because basically informality in this regard, it substitutes where a system doesn't work, so it complements the system. So I would appreciate your take on that. Another thing that wasn't mentioned at the panel is uh, the academic cooperation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can hardly find in the region, uh, for example, Uzbek specialist on Kazakhstan. A Kazakh specialist on Tajikistan. You can find Kazakh specialists on Central Asia easily. Tajik specialists on Central Asia easily. But you cannot find this kind of narrow specialization, or you can barely find it. So how to actually tackle this issue and bring a better perspective, because sometimes Central Asia fall into a trap that we know our neighbors trap, you know? And so in order to proceed further and understand each other further and boost the trade, transport, and other issues, I think it's essential to actually to uh, incentivize uh, this kind of academic cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should I start? Go ahead. Um, thank you. I mean, I, th I like your point about informality, which shows from Farouk spent serious amounts of time in Sweden, and I'm sure that informed <laughs> that, that comparison between Scandinavia and, and Central Asia. I don't think we're saying that institutionalization should be for the purpose of institutions. I think what we're saying is that, especially because of the top-down nature of political systems, the only way that the cooperation is going to get a life, aside from what the presidents decide at a summit, is, and, and by the way, that leads into the second point you're making, because as you, as you said, these countries don't really necessarily know each other very well. By the way, I think you, you can extend that argument to all, maybe with the exception of China, but... These countries, each country is playing the role that Turkey did after 1991. The Turks thought they were the superior folk with the, we, we do everything better, and they went around to all the, the Central Asians and and eventually managed to 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 evoke a, a real reaction. But but I, I think my impression is that the first that business people are the ones that are going to really build this. 
uh, they're, they're the ones that they're going to lead and they will develop real expertise, but it won't come out into the general, general public. Uh, but second, I think in every case, the, you know, the Kyrgyz are going to come, to come to Uzbekistan and say, well, you know, come on, we, we have a real business culture. They're just playing at it here. The, the Uzbeks are going to say the same in Turkmenistan. The Turkmen will say it. And it'll go all the way around the circle, which, is, which I think is evidence of serious engagement. And I think you're going to see real deals, not just the ethnic ones, the, the people of Uzbek descent in southern Kazakhstan trading again across that border, although that is enormously increased. Um, uh, th that will happen everywhere, but I think you're going to see real business deals, and this is going to develop among this young business class uh, levels of, of expertise that are, are very concrete. And, and very beneficial to the region as such. Sitting in front of you is a guy who's had a lot of contact with Kazakhs who've had these cross-country business dealings. Now, for example, in the area of water, um, uh, are intensely bureaucratic. They're still dominated by some of the old dogs who dominated them in the past. And it's interesting that the new initiatives on, on this uh, in the area of water, and there have been, uh, that were placed directly under the UN so outsiders couldn't mess around with them. These new initiatives uh, involve new, new organizations and new people and new everything. And I, I, I don't think you're going to see a lot of old institutions evolve genially into new. And with regard to external ones, there is a whole web of them. You mentioned a couple, but my goodness, uh, you could spend most of your year uh, traipsing from one, from one meeting of, uh, uh, of three or four days, uh, followed by a grand banquet, uh, uh, of, of one of these coordinating organizations their nature, very large, complicated international organization. The very rare is the one that is as successful as the World Bank was with the, with the uh, 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 1000 uh, uh, um, electricity line. Uh, but, but I think we're past that era. I think those all exist. I, I haven't seen any new one formed in the last few years. And, and, and I think the initiative has switched from externally or external organizations uh, to internally organized ones. And it is done in recognition of the shortcomings of the former. Can I just add, I think the, uh, the CAREC, I mean, uh, in which they have openly shared that they are looking at other models, and it is in that spirit that we have produced these, uh, our two cents of, uh, of ideas about it. They, of course, leaders in this region will know infinitely more than we do what the limitations are, what they're likely to get away with, either with their domestic, you know, constituencies, whether it be cotton barons or oligarchs or whatever, uh, and what they will be able to, again, get away with in terms of uh, which countries will sign up, what will Turkmenistan sign up to, for example, I think is going to be important in looking at the lowest common denominator among the countries. Uh, what will uh, be acceptable to great powers east and north, and so on. Um, it'll be up to them to finesse those, those details. Does it mean that they will continue gradually and slowly to build something on the basis of informality, or will they, will they actually move into some, to institutionalizing something as they did 15, 20 years ago? I don't think we, we know, uh, and maybe there is, we shouldn't know. Maybe it's better that they know who they are, they are not spooked to the extent they were, even by the fact that returning ISIS fighters are in Afghanistan. They, they were able to deal with that kind of situation without panicking, uh, with some exceptions perhaps. But I think that the consolidation of sovereignty means that they are now in a position to take the leader to take a leading role in developing regional cooperation rather than having outsiders do it. A very quick note, and that is with official cuisine and official wines. Uh, the, the, the period we're entering now, the, the test of all this is going to be, are they able to really create an economic reality? 
It, it's what the younger generation of investors and businessmen in the region do. This is the key to everything. If they really get going, which uh, there's some evidence that that's happening, uh, if there is a Central Asian, great, Greater Central Asian Chamber of Commerce, for example, uh, made up of chambers of commerce from all these places, if there are opportunities, so what is your advice to them uh, would be very helpful for me to know. Thank you. Let's respond to that. Question here. I'm Sam Wyman. I'm just an intro. The last word. Okay. Um, I just one general point about. Uh, I mean, the the. Uh, just to make it clear, the main, in, in a way, one of the main targets for our research is not really this room, but the Central Asians. No offense. I mean, but the idea is to put forward things that the Central Asians may not be very well aware of. That's why we didn't include. The last word. Okay. Um, I just one general point about. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, just to make a, it clear, the main, in, in a way, one of the main targets for our research is not really this room, but the Central Asians. No offense. I mean, but the idea is to put forward things that the Central Asians may not be very well aware of. That's why we didn't.